Well, um, it's great actually I'm following a neuroscientist, isn't it? I feel this is like going from the profound to the trivial. Um, uh, thank you for organizing it that way. I should have, you know, anyway, shut up, John. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, and I'm going to talk to you about what it says there, what makes uh, a great idea. And uh, the reason I'm giving this talk is that I was asked this question some years ago uh, to give a lecture on what do I look for in a great idea. And uh, at the time, I, I, I kind of went, well, sort of something I like, really, which actually, if you think about it, would have made a very short lecture. So I had to kind of stand back from that and think about what I was doing, the work I loved, the work I was doing, the work that uh, turned me on, the things that I liked in life. Why did I like them? And in a way, what I'm talking about is if you're in a creative profession or you're doing anything related to creativity, the major theme of my talk is you have to have a philosophy. You have to kind of believe in something. You don't just, you know, get up in the morning and paint a picture. You get up in the morning to paint a picture that's going to say something that you feel very strongly. Because I define, you know, there are lots of definitions of creativity, and I define, one of, one of them is the one I like to define it as, as an expression of self. We are all creative. It's just some of us are now living by it. But in essence, creativity is an expression of self. There are lots of other definitions of it, so, you know. Uh, we could go on about that for some time. So there I was, I was in that situation, and I thought, bloody hell, I've got to give this talk, what the hell am I going to do? I had to think about what it was. And then, as I say, I looked at um, uh, my work and looked at everything I did, and I realized there was one thing that was driving everything I did and everything that I loved from the moment I kind of had a sort of uh, uh, a reasonably adult brain, and it was this, irreverence. And I loved irreverent things, I loved irreverent art, I loved irreverent music, I loved... I, I just thought it was fantastic. And my work was kind of uh, skewered with this. It was a kind of way I thought, and it was what I was doing. <clears throat> so, in this talk, I thought, and I'm going to give it to you in a very, very truncated form, um, I thought I would step out of, and I always think it's great, whenever you're doing something, whenever you're you know, you're working on anything or any product or project or whatever it is to do, it's always great to step outside of it and look at how it infects the world around you. So the thing that fascinated me was I actually went, I, I, I went to, I was like, I went to art school, from art school to design school, and once I was at design school, I decided that I wanted to go into advertising because it was all about ideas and I loved ideas. And um, so, I stood outside of the world I occupy, which is advertising, and I looked at, well, why was art, why was art, why did art move from revering to being irreverent? Because actually, if you look back, history of art, in a sense, it revered. And, you know, we can look at, you know, great pieces of work or, you know, whatever it is. It was essentially their uh, uh, to revere. It was, it was owned by, and the reason for this is that it was in the hands of rulers, it was in the hands of monarchs, it was in the hands of the church, it was in the hands of power. And power dictated to artists what they wanted. And they said, this is what we want, this is what we want people to believe in, you have to go out and do it. So they were communicators, but they were very much uh, under, under the control of power. I always like this picture, actually, because I can't remember the artist who did it, but I always think it's great because this guy's obviously about five foot four, but according to that picture, I think he's about six foot seven. You know, you can see that horse must be very, very small. But obviously, if the artist paid him the, painted him the true size he was, he'd have probably had his head chopped off. So it, it paid to kind of revere. And of course, the Renaissance uh, was a time when the church was very powerful, uh, and at that time, <clears throat> the artists were there to get people to believe in the church. Uh, and I always think those, those artists of that time were, were kind of a bit like art directors today. We all know what the product does, 
um, I've got to constantly refresh your your view of it. And uh, of course, you know, Renaissance painters had the same thing. We all knew the story, you know, born of, born of a Virgin Mary, you know, and all that stuff. And on the cross, three days later, rose up, went to heaven. And what they had to constantly do was to make you kind of believe in it, see in it a different way. We all knew the story. Uh, and as I say, I liken that to kind of being an art director in an advertising agency today. We know what the car does, I just have to make you think about it a bit differently. So they were dealing with that. <clears throat> and of course, you know, um, there were lots of, you know, here we are, you know, Christ being taken from the cross, you know, you can sort of, I always imagine that feeling, you know, the church when they were saying, they'd sit around and say, no, we've had a lot of him coming off the cross, we've got to have something new, can we have something putting up on the cross? What about up on the cross, you know? It's a bit like the front cover of Vogue, isn't it? No, we've seen Kate, she's been on it too many times. Can't we have something else, a bit fresh, you know? What about get the Virgin Mary back on? She hasn't been used for some time, you know? They were dealing with that. That's what they were dealing with. And, um, of course, one of the all-time great pieces of, of uh, Renaissance work was, of course, the Sistine Chapel. Um, and, you know, within that, although Michelangelo uh, did do some fairly... Um, irreverent things, uh, he had to actually get people to believe. He had to take the Bible and explain it to people and make them feel truly wonderful about it. Of course, you know, um, the thing that uh, happened to, to, and there he is, and there's, there's God on the right. Uh, man's got a very, very small willy. I don't know why that was. <laughs> Actually, I've always thought, I've always wondered if he intended God to be wearing a pink negligee. I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I kind of find that a bit weird, you know. Um, but anyway, that's what God's doing. And, and the, the other thing you have to remember about Michelangelo, I always think Michelangelo was the, the first great art director. You know, he was always fighting the client. He went over budget and he didn't quite make it on time, you know. <laughs> So, you know, the first great art director. And of course, the other thing that happened to all those creative people out there, you know, when the client changes your work, you know, which is deeply insulting, you know, you put all yourself into it, you kind of feel affronted by that. Well, it happened to Michelangelo, an artist called um, <clears throat> Daniel Del Volterra had to <clears throat> go back and repaint um, bits of uh, The Last Judgment on the Sistine Chapel altarpiece because there was far too much nudity in it. So he had to go up and put wispy bits on and stuff like that. So there was Michelangelo, probably the greatest artist of all time. And some bloke was whipping up once he'd sort of, you know, disappeared off the face of the earth, painting on wispy bits. So that was art. That was it. And, and you know, you, 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 if you didn't adhere to what uh, uh, authority wanted, then you were in a pretty bad place. You didn't eat much, and starvation is never great for artistry. I can promise you that. Um, but things change. Now, I'm going to show you a picture, <coughs> and I know I'm going to come back to it. And it's that. And that picture does have uh, an awful lot of importance, but I will refer back to that because it's about choice. And we just heard from Stephen's talk about choice and what that actually means. But of course, what happened is society changed, power started to move to people, uh, education, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press spread books and therefore knowledge and all of those things, and gradually power was taken from authority. And it was taken from authority and it became vested in people. So challenging ideas began to emerge. We don't necessarily believe in that. We don't believe in this. Um, there were revolutions and things like that. So authority was losing the ability to dictate. Now, I'm being very fast in all of this. So you kind of reach a, a point, for instance, you know, when you, when you look at, say, for instance, the Dadaists. I mean, the Dadaists in, in you know, 1916, 18, and all that, work was really about being affronted by the inhumane slaughter of the, the First World War. I and mean, they objected to it, and they wanted to fight authority. And we all know about Dauchon's pissoir. Uh, but also, you know, they did things like taking the Mona Lisa and putting a moustache on her. And, you know, that sort of irreverence 
began to creep into work because basically people were challenging, challenging authority, challenging the way things were, and saying, no, I've got a better idea than you. You should think about this idea, not that idea. <clears throat> but the beautiful, the wonderful thing about irreverence is, I think, that it infected all kinds of creativity. You know, for me, the Bauhaus was a, was a, a, a fantastic movement, a movement where, you know, this school came together, and most of us just think about it as, as, as a place where, you know, we think about the furniture, but it encompassed all the arts. It really was genuinely a place where people felt they could do anything and challenge the status quo. And, of course, this famous chair was, was really... One of the things that was amazing about it was using industrial, industrial techniques and industrial materials to make a piece of home furniture. And that's sort of very irreverent thought. I mean, the idea of doing that back then was just kind of crazy. But that irreverence gave this piece of work uh, and gave, you know, later work <clears throat> a real kind of energy, uh, a, a dynamism that actually drove it and made it very different. And, you know, you can look at just the typography that came out of the Bauhaus. If one looks back at something that was being done at a similar time to that, a very traditional, centered, everything like that, the Bauhaus changed it. It challenged the way we absorbed information. It challenged the way we did things. And, of course, you know, irreverence <clears throat> came into many more things. Um, jazz was really the music of a downtrodden people. It was the music of people who, who couldn't express themselves. And it was through their music that they could express themselves. And jazz was considered very, you know, by the kind of people, by the middle classes of the time in America, a really dreadful music, very reverent, and played in bordellos and brothels and God knows what else. But in fact, it had an energy. It challenged the way music was being performed. And, of course, <coughs> that morphs into rock and roll. Uh, and rock and roll was kind of, you know, a, a music genre that actually changed the way people felt or think, thought or felt. And, of course, you know, its, it's, its history comes from jazz through the blues, through everything. So you can see this irreverence, irreverence going through things, very powerful. And you're right up to the modern day. I mean, I always think, you know, this is one of the the greatest, you know, products of, of, of the industrial age, the mini car. I mean, for all kinds of things. You know, what made that car amazing? What actually was the real breakthrough in that car back in 1959 when uh, Isigonis designed it? <clears throat> was his brief was, how do you make a very small car big on the inside? Which is, like, absurd. How do I do that? I can't do that. It's an impossibility. It's a certain size. Well, what he did <clears throat> was he turned the engine sideways. He just turned the engine sideways, and all of a sudden, he had more room for people inside the cabin. And that piece of irreverent thinking, that sort of going, I am not going to follow what everybody else does. I'm going to think about it in a very different way, produced a building of uh, a car of uh, amazing longevity. Uh, and as we can see today, it's hugely successful. <laughs> when you look at architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water House, a brilliant example of, of, of his belief in he wasn't going to change the course of the river, he wasn't going to put the house next to the river, he would just let the river run through it. You know, brilliant. I mean, nobody... So what? You know, nobody would have thought like that. A great example of irreverent thinking. And, of course, we all know his Guggenheim Museum in New York. A wonderful example of, create, of, of irreverence. I mean, there it is, with all square buildings around it, and he's designed it to be round. But wait a minute, you want flat walls for an art gallery, don't you? Because you go, but it works, and it works brilliantly. A wonderful piece of, of, of thinking that makes you consider creativity <clears throat> before you actually even step over the threshold. So, you kind of go, you know, and there's the, the Bilbao, in, uh, the Guggenheim in Bilbao, the same thing. However, you can look at punk, can't you, and say that was phenomenally irreverent. That was incredibly irreverent. And my belief is it, it kind of failed. Um, we look at it in a kind of fashion sense now. It's kind of, you know, it didn't have any underlying principles about it. What was it challenging? What was it trying to change? It was just opposing things rather than being for things. And, you know, as a fashion look, um, very interesting, very, you know, we can be intrigued by it, 
Um, you can still see influences of it today. But ultimately, I think it failed because it didn't have a philosophical belief at its heart. What was it trying to do? What was it trying to say? Whereas for me, pop art did. I think it was, you know, if you look at Warhol's work and if you look at all of the pop artists, what they were trying to do was they were trying to sort of get you to look at the world and get you to see these people were important. This lady is an icon. You know, she's iconic in the way Jesus was iconic to other people. <coughs> and of course, capturing as Warhol did his electric chair series. Phenomenal picture in my view, absolutely incredible. Um, and so you can see how irreverence cuts through because we're challenging, we're constantly questioning. How oh, you come to advertising, and here was a campaign that was very irreverent. Um, but I think actually it lacked uh, any sincerity. And at the, at the heart of what you do as a creative person, if you don't have a fundamental truth, if you don't believe in what you're doing, if you're just trying to shock people, which you can do, which punk kind of did, then I think it is very, very shallow. And that, I think, is very, very dangerous. And, you know, of course, it's very easy um, uh, uh, to shock people. You know, I can do that without question. One of the ways that you have to, com when you're communicating, is to use humor. Humor is fundamentally important in communication because it gets people to accept ideas that they find difficult to accept. It gets them to relax and listen and watch. And, you know, it makes you see it in a different way. So, obviously, if I write crap, shit, fuck, bollocks, whatever, like that, you know, um, it can be sort of, you know, you can be affronted by it. But, of course, if I write it like that, it suddenly has a kind of humor and a wit and a charm to it. And, of course, we have to understand that, you know, humor is uh, the enemy of authority. Which kind of then sort of takes me back to that picture uh, of uh, all those shoes. Or I could have put up a picture of trying to buy a television set, or I could put up a picture of trying to buy a pair of jeans. In the world of communication, we're constantly, constantly being sort of hit with images, messages, da, da, da. how do I get you to look at my message? How do I get you to pay attention to what I'm saying? How do I get you pay, to pay attention to it, listen to it, and take it on board? And I found the power of irreverence does that, uh, because it gives an idea not only sort of resonance, but it makes it stick in your mind. And you can see how it affects not only the communications industry, but painting, but architecture, uh, car design, whatever design you want to, to look at. So um, we at uh, BBH have, have kind of, we have a black sheep as our logo, and that's kind of to remind people when the world zigs, you should zag. Don't do what everybody else does, which is in, in itself is a very irreverent thought. And I thought what I'd like to do is I'd like to leave you with one piece of work. I'm only going to show you one piece of work. And what I love about this is, is that <clears throat> in 60 seconds, I have actually explained the meaning of life. Now, I know Stephen is investigating the meaning of life, and what he's going to do is a lot more profound, as I've said, than what I'm doing, because I'm fairly trivial, uh, and I celebrate triviality, actually. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, here is, in my view, uh, the meaning of life uh, in 60 seconds.